So welcome to what appears to have been one of my most cursed videos ever. Yes, this is the Soviet Navy and this is 1965 to 1991. It was of course the period which she's the carrier Kuznetsov come into existence. And for the first time ever, I recorded a video which went through completely fine. This video runs fine on my computer. But the small problem is it won't upload. It won't load up at all. So I'm going to do it again. And hopefully this one, hopefully this one will work. So cross fingers for me as we go into the Soviet Navy, 1965 to 1991, the period where the carrier Kuznetsov, the most unlucky carrier known to mankind, makes its, assistant, its entrance. Wish me luck. Wish me luck. I'm going to need it. So, Soviet Navy. What is this period about? What is going on with the Soviet Navy? Well, many things are going on with the Soviet Navy in this period. For starters, they're reaching a point at which they're having to build what you would call a fully functioning navy. But they have a slightly different emphasis than everyone else. Something I've talked about a lot in other videos, especially videos where I've been discussing the larger navies, is the reality that the high-low mix is a very nice quick catch-all, but it's not really the true description. Because what is the low in high threat areas and what can be the high in low threat areas is a very different thing from what is the high in high threat areas and what is the low in low threat areas. I.e. sloops. The Royal Navy in interwar period use a lot of them. Sloops. Modern OPVs are probably about the same thing we have equivalently in terms of firepower and capabilities. Although the firepower of a 1920 sloop would actually scare most modern OPVs. But leave that to one side. Firepower-wise, they're about the same on the sort of level of chart. And, yeah, sloops are perfectly good low level in low threat areas. But they're not really what you want to see a low level in a high threat area, are they? You don't really want to send a sloop into that area. That's where your cruisers come in. But your cruisers in a low threat area, compared to a sloop, are, cannot be called low level. They're not going to be. And we can't say a cruiser is high level when there are also carriers and capital ships in the mix. Can you? You can't. When a ca cruiser is sailing along next to, a, uh, next to a battleship, it's not exactly the high level threat, is it? Yes, look at me. I've got 12 six-inch guns. I'm scary. I'm a town class. Well, you are scary. But the thing next to you is called HMS Warspite. It has eight 15-inch guns, a complete mine of its own, and no known fear. Other than potentially the fear that it might not be fast enough to catch whoever it's trying to take out at that particular time. However, when it's, hello, I'm HMS... I don't know, Glasgow, sailing next to HMS Folkestone, a sloop with three, a couple of four-inch guns. Well, you can't exactly call it a low-level threat then, can you? So, it's always been the case that there is this medium layer. There is this middle layer. But if you go high, medium, low, if we say that, high, medium, low, it sounds like we are listing out a different size of cups in a coffee shop. It just, it doesn't sound as good. So we talk about the high-low mix. Now the problem for the Soviet Navy, the problem for the Soviet Navy is they're trying to build this. And whilst I think the US Navy with the Constitution, with the Const uh, Constitution class might be getting it right, Constellation class. I called them the Constitutions, didn't I? Keeps happening to me. Uh, I said this video has seemed cursed. This is recording number five. So, fingers crossed. 
Whilst the US Navy seems to have got that medium level right, it's very, very difficult to get. And the Soviet Navy seems to judge their medium a little high and their low a little low. This means the low isn't enough to do what they really want and really should be done by all their low-level vessels. And the mediums are, in a way, a bit expensive to do it. And you can see this because of the poor Krivat class frigates. They become these ubiquitous workhorses that are running around. And they're probably the best attempt the Soviets have at a medium. But the trouble is with the Krivat is it's not really enough to be a medium it's a low level medium a very low level medium as such it doesn't have the mm, the status it needs to be the high level in low threat environments and that is a real problem for the Soviet Union when it comes to naval diplomacy now why am I starting all this out with talking about this when I've got SSBNs up here well the SSBNs, I'm sure, are going to be a big feature of the live, but the reason I'm starting up discussing this is because you have to understand why the Soviet Union is building a navy. There have been lots of discussions about this, and the amount of people who have gone into various chats with me and talked about on Discord and in the YouTube comments, etc., about Gorshkov, uh, whether he was right or wrong, whether it was the Soviet Union shouldn't have invested in navy, there's no military reason for a navy. And it's very hard for me to defend them on the, against that because, honestly, I agree with them. Militarily, if I was building a force purely based around fighting wars for the Soviet Union, I would not be bothering to waste my money on a navy. I wouldn't. Why? Well, at least half my fleet is going to be caught in places like the Baltic and the Black Sea, which means, at best, if I manage to get Turkey and Greece to fight a war with each other, it's going to be trapped or not going anywhere. And the Baltic is going to be so surrounded by airstrikes that I'm not going to get it anywhere. So, yeah, that's not going to happen. Unless I manage to beat them back on land. To the point at which I get to the Denmark Straits. The Northern Fleet is going to be dealing with the NATO task forces heading up to the GIUK gap. And whilst I, if I have surface raiders going around the world, and I'll be getting into the submarine involvement of surface raiders and why they actually are built to maximise the impact of surface raiders and some of the things they do in a bit, they are not going to be enough to draw off enough of the force that I'm going to be able to win that fight because they are going to bring more. And then I've got a Pacific Fleet. Which the trouble is, I'm focusing on fighting in Europe, and the Pacific Fleet has got to deal with whatever the US Navy has there, and whatever the Japanese have there. And the South Koreans. Uh, this is not going to be good. This is not a good scenario for me. So, why am I building a navy? <laughs> why am I building one? Because it's not about winning the war. Well, it is about winning the war, but it's about a longer game than actually fighting battles. You see, you win wars not just by winning the actual battles. You can win a war before it even starts, if you've won the peace. How do you win the peace? Well, if you're a Soviet economy, you are a planned economy. You're a planned economy because that's how they work themselves out. And by the way, there's a big difference between socialism and communism. And I do not want to get into that discussion again in the comments. They are not the same. I don't like any ideologies. So I'm not really used to defending and not really a person who should be called upon to defend any ideology. But doing that is like saying fascism and conservatism are the same. They're not. They're all... They might have roots in each other, but by the time they've reached the point at which they have their own name, they're usually sufficiently different that they do leave each other a long way away. But, the thing about a communist economy, and to extent a fascist, and a fascist economy, is they are very planned, state-controlled models of economic power. And that means you have slightly less thought in terms of 
spread of thought of how the money is going to be pursued. It can make it more efficient, but it also means they're going to have less options to pick on what to be efficient of. So if the only option they think of is an inefficient one, they're going to go holes, barrels, everything into that inefficient option and going to end up causing themselves lots of trouble. Whereas usually in a capitalist system, um, in an economic model, there's pros in most liberal in liberal countries around the sort of world, most Western countries, they have a system whereby you have a plurality of ideas, some of which will be hilariously inefficient, some of them which will be hilariously absurd, and some which will be work within the world realms of efficiency and affordability and sensibility, and usually those will win out. Now the point is, if you want the Soviet Union to work, you've got to expand the Soviet Union. Because command economies can only work if you can have total control over the economics. And if you are completely out of the global economy, so you cannot be a factor in that at all, you can only call on the resources you actually control. So, in order to survive longer term, you need to control more and more territory. Or you need to adjust your aims, or go for partially capitalist. You need to either integrate yourself into the global economy and accept the necessary... Mm, how do I put this, the necessary uh, inconsistencies that are going to be caused by that, or you need to take over the whole global economy. And there's a problem with that, because the global economy has been set up by the West. It's been set up, to an extent, by Britain during the Age of Empire, and America has moved into that slot after World War II, definitely there was a transition sort of starting to take place during the interwar years where Britain and America were both there. But there is a reason why London is still a massive financial centre and New York is a massive financial centre because those two had been working together already for a long, long time. And they have a huge advantage. And if you're going to try and build some centre to rival them, well, you've got a pro massive problem because they already have the infrastructure there. They just have to improve infrastructure, so it's always cheaper for them to enhance and move themselves up than it is for you to build something to compete with them. It always is. So what you need to do is either destroy them or take them over, mm -hmm. which is more difficult and uh, more easier said than done. Now, that's the problem. So you want to try and maximise the number of countries who are part of your system because the more countries you have as part of your system, the more resources you have. Because communism and its base part in its terms of economic approach, and this is the same with fascism, is mercantilism. Okay? It's about control of resources. It views wealth as he who controls or they who control resources has the power. They do not believe resources have the ability to be mm, deployed more efficiently, etc. No, no, no. You have to physically control the things. It's a very mm, physical approach to economics. So you want more countries involved. So, therefore, you want to send ships around and do political missions that are going to get more countries involved. And when you have a space race, that's a great way of trying to show your power. As long as you win it. And honestly, the thing I find interesting about the space race is that it falls apart really after the Soviet Union stopped, stopped really taking part in it. Because the race was to get to the moon first. And really what the Soviet Union should have done is not told the Americans and adjusted the race to the first to set up a base on the moon. The, uh, basically, that is the point. Um, the Soviets had done the first to get to space, the Americans immediately readjusted it to the first to reach the moon. And the Soviets didn't then readjust it. Oh, right. So, the Soviets then have to do other things, and are doing other things for that political statement. Now, sending round surface ships around the world is a great way of doing political <coughs> political sort of ingratiation, and a lot of way of making a statement, and of your power and your status. And the Soviets are getting into that. But they're also sending their submarines around the world. And why is that? Because if you want to make your surface raiders even nastier, you have them combined with submarines. Now, what's the problem for a submarine? If you've said torpedoes, you are right. 
Yes, they have limitations of food, but the biggest limitations they have are torpedoes. Why? They're big, they're heavy. Once they run out of them, it's very difficult to reload them. You need to be in a port facility. So for a submarine, long range surface raiding is not really an option. They can go out there, they can hit a few targets, but they're going to run out of torpedoes a long time before they run out of targets, and they need to save some torpedoes because they might have to deal with threats to, before they get home to get rearmed. However, <laughs> if you have a surface raider running around, i.e. a surface ship, which has guns, those shells are going to be quite a nasty system for taking out merchant vessels, especially when we consider merchant vessels in this period are starting the procession to what we have today, where they are very where the actual containers aboard them are stronger and are actually part of their well their survivability and structural integrity rather than the hull. I.e. the strength of the containers and the subdivision of the containers is actually part of the design of the the whole survivability of a container ship. Mm -hmm. It gets fun when you start looking at the full container ship designs. Now, if you can take them out with a few rounds from your gun, you've just sunk them. Okay. So, I now know a surface raiders in the South Atlantic. Now, my first response would have been to send, probably, a carrier group. But I'd have sent a light carrier group. You know, I don't need to send many escorts. Just a couple. And a carrier. And the carrier strike will take it out. But if there are also submarines around down there. Well, the submarines won't be waiting. Won't be doing the surface raiding. I've got to respond to go and get that surface raider. But, um, yeah. Now there's submarines. And I've got to send a full carrier battle group. Because the submarines aren't going to be waiting for the merchant ships. They're going to be hanging around waiting for the carrier. The carrier to come out of the heavily patrolled Northern Atlantic with all the support assets which are up there. All the, you know, all the sonar li uh, sonus, sonus lines, all those sort of systems. All those things which give them a massive advantage and basically turn the Northern Atlantic into a home court advantage for a carrier battle group. I want them out of there, because if I can sink a carrier paddle group, that's going to be a political win. That is going to be a great political win. But it's not enough on its own, is it? So now your response is probably going to be, well, okay, we'll deploy bomber groups. Where? Because, uh, to put the words of Winston Churchill, nothing is more difficult and less mobile than a heavy bomber squadron. Or a heavy bomber wing. You, need, you can send them aircraft, yes, you can fly them there, but you also need to send the maintainers. You need to send spare parts, you need to send fuel, you need to send bombs, munitions. All the things they need to support them. Oh, and by the way, you better have an airfield which is big enough to take them. Okay, well, instead of that, that what we'll do is we'll tank them from an airfield which we already have, and that can take them. Okay, so you're going to use tankers as well now. So that's tankers and bombers you've taken away from fighting in Europe. And tankers and bombers might be more useful to the front line and more people calling out for them for the front line than the actual carrier battle group. Because on the sur first sur surface of it, you're fighting in Germany. Why are you taking support aircraft and bombers and, tanker and tankers which are keeping the fighters and AWACS afloat away from Germany? What kind of cruel person are you? You can see the headlines or the discussions after war. Oh, this was such a few exercise just to deal with this one ship. They say the way to win a battle, win a war, is to give your opponent more dilemmas than they give you. That's been a phrase that's been going around for a fair number of years now. Well, let's be honest, a single surface ship and a couple of submarines in the South Atlantic suddenly gives a whole lot of dilemmas to NATO. A whole lot of dilemmas to NATO. 
especially when they basically want South America and Africa to go benevolent neutral to them. They want benevolent neutral to them. Soviet Union would like benevolent neutral to them. Why? Because that means there could be supplies. If you've got India, if you and the Soviet Union makes great efforts to try and woo India, if you've got these countries going benevolently neutral to you, then you are far more secure. You can get supplies. You can possibly base operations from there or run other things through there. And again, you have to think about this from the Soviet perspective. One of the good things about the Soviets was they never got quite caught into the same war will go nuclear very quickly trap. It did affect part of their design. It did affect some of their design considerations, but they never got caught into the same trap as NATO did on war will be 45 minutes and it then will all be dead in a radiated mass. However, they did produce this. I will... I... I I try and say something good about every ship I ever put up. And um, I'm, I'm told this class had a spacious hangar. They had a spacious box for helicopters. And honestly, I can understand where they come from when you're trying to do and adapt to anti-submarine warfare. In an era where you have ships which are very useful anti-submarine warfare assets, but which do not have hangars themselves. Some of them don't even have landing spots for helicopters, and helicopters are now the coming thing for anti-submarine warfare. It makes sense. They're also absolutely terrible, but it makes sense. You can see the logic. don't have enough iron brew to stare at that picture. But this is where the problem starts to come in with the high-low mix for the Soviet Union. Because with their work on titanium, which, by the way, is one of the reasons why Russia is still a leading centre of knowledge on titanium, which develops the PAPA, which, of course, can go 44 to 45 knots. There is a debate exactly how fast it could go, I think... The official point is 44.7. I think there is a... Might have gone 44.8. And I know at least... One former submariner who reckons they clocked it going 45. It was a fast boat. A very fast and very capable boat. But... And I say this honestly... It's not necessarily the best vessel for the Soviet Union to have. It's great, though, from a political perspective. From a military perspective, you've got a class of one, which is the fastest submarine in the world. What's the response going to be? Well, the response, although it takes a while to develop and doesn't come into service until ooh, really the 1990s, is um, the Spearfish Torpedo. And if we consider that... Papa comes into service in 1968. The Royal Navy first starts off with the Tigerfish torpedo, which can do 35 knots. That's what they sort of produce, bring into service in 1979. But they know that's not going to be fast enough. So they work on the Spearfish torpedo. And the Spearfish Torpedo is very cool, but that doesn't come into service until 1992. And, um, well, how do I put this politely? Uh, there are various claims of its speed and the sketch of the speed. The official sort of speed is roughly 80 knots. I've seen some people try and uh, say 70. Others say higher than 80. I would say it doesn't really matter what it is. In that if you, if it's going about double your speed, um, 
then frankly, you're not going to get away from it. it ju you're just not. But the problem is, and it's a real serious problem, what does this vessel do militarily for the Russians? It's a single vessel. Yes, it leads to another class who are also very fast and capable vessels, but it's a single vessel. What does it give the Soviet Union? Militarily, what is the point in this? Zilch. But let's put it this way. You turn around and say we have the fastest submarine in the world. That sounds pretty darn cool. We have the fastest torpedo in the world. It might be militarily more effective. Might be militarily more effective. But... Politically, it's not. And the Soviet Navy is all about politics. It's all about winning the peace. It's all about winning the peace to make the war easier. And then you have the Kara class. Which look like they've been designed by a seven-year-old boy. Please note, I'm being emphasis on that because... If I asked my seven-year-old cousins who are girls to design a car, a design a ship, theirs would come out looking currently more like HMS Dreadnought. They don't think missiles look cool. Um, the seven-year-old boy cousins would design something with missiles and guns festooned everywhere. So, that's purely based on my cousin's sampling, okay? If I was um, being slightly ruder, I would say it looks like a designer was dropped into a weapons warehouse and told whatever they licked they could fit. And they went liquorlicious. But the point is, that thing turns up in 1970s. At your nation's doorstep, comes into your port to visit you. That looks like you imagine a modern warship to be. It is festooned with everything. It's got guns. It's got helicopters. It's got missiles. It's got everything. And those missiles are big, stonking missiles. And look at the size of that radar. It's colossal. Yeah, yeah, microprocessors and all those things might be coming in and might make things smaller and all those things, but look at how big it is. Oh, that looks like a radar looks in my mind. And that's the point. Good, high level capability. I would argue, though, again, there's still a little bit of high to be your medium-level asset. That's the trouble, the Kravax and the Karas. One's a little low, one's a little high. And yes, you've got some excellent destroyers coming in, but again, they're also a little high. Why? Because there is that small problem. As whilst... On a academic level and a strategic level, you might think your ships have no point. They are going to die a glorious death in the Baltic. They're going to be trapped at best in the Black Sea. Unless NATO can somehow get the Greeks and the Turks to combine together, in which case there could be a major problem in that because in the Black Sea, if those two ever actually combine together, Goodness gracious me, the combined fighting ferocity of the Greek uh, Greco-Turkish forces would probably take out most of southern Russia. Let's be honest, both are very passionate forces with a lot of elan, especially in the 70s. If sufficiently motivated and combined together, they would be very scary. But... 
and I say this gloriously. But from a Soviet perspective, none of that's good. But still, you don't want to design a ship which you think is going to die. So you try and put these weapon systems on it. You try and make it at least look capable and look like you're designing it to live. And that's that's the reality. That is what the reality is of what you're dealing with. Now, after the Pappas come the Alphas. After the Pappas come the Alphas. And the Alpha class... They're special. They really are special. They are 41 knots of speed. They have a crew of 31 all officers. And they are a capability which gives the Soviet Union the capability to fight. That's what they're getting from them. But they're only getting seven units because they're very, very difficult to build. They're also, you can tell their, their value because the Soviet Union is prepared to start uh, to not look like the egalitarian force they always try and claim to be. They're an all officer crew. The problem for the Soviet Union is twofold. One, if you have someone for two years and they're a conscript, or three years even and they're a conscript, there is only so much you can train them. You can only train them so well because they're going to be in and out. If you have someone and you turn your forces into a professional force, a professional reserve force, where most people are doing more than two years, you can get some very skilled people up. But the problem is your lack of NCOs. Because once you have a conscript force, it then becomes far harder to generate the low-level NCOs because you've got such a churn of people. And some of the people you want to pick to be low-level NCOs, well, you lose them quite quickly because they might go off to become officers. They might go off to become... <sighs> they might just leave and not want to stay in the military. You know, you, you look at your smartest troops and you go, right, and you're who I want to be my Lance Corporals because you're thinking. Great. You lose two-thirds of them off because they don't want to stay. You lose... Of the remaining third, 80% go off to become officers. And the remainder want to become NCOs? If you're lucky. The trouble is, most of the people, that's not going to constitute the majority of people who want to remain and who are your theoretical pool of NCOs. Especially when your NCOs are, especially lower rank of NCOs, are chosen more for political reliability than necessarily their actual combat skill. This causes issues. It causes issues with your training, it causes issues with your management, it causes issues with your design of ships. But the lack of the NCO layer is really seen in when you have things like the alphas. Because if you have something which requires really prof long-term professional masses amount of training to operate, because it's really high tech, if you looked at a Western force, the odds are a fairly large group of them would be warrant officers and NCOs. A fairly large group of them would be warrant officers and NCOs. They don't have that option in the Soviet Union. So they have to throw away the idea that everyone's equal, da, 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 da. no, we're making officer-only submarines. 
And yes, that's an elite unit. Yes, great. But that's kind of already saying and admitting that some people are better than others. When the reality is, it's your time of the, and them in service and your training abilities. But also, that becomes a problem if you have an all-officer ship. An all-officer boat is an issue. Why? Because officers are going to be having to do some things in there. And where are you going to promote them? You're, you've created yourself two problems. One, you're probably going to select your best and brightest to be alpha alpha it's to serve in your alphas because they're going you're going to need them to be your best and brightest and then they're going to be stuck being basically the junior sailors on a sub rather than learning how to actually command and lead a submarine they're going to learn not by being in charge of anyone but by being un uh, being in being in charge of and then when it comes to promotions, some of them are you're going to want to keep in the alphas. But what are you going to do the rest? Are you going to still promote them? Well, they're probably your best and brightest. You're going to want to promote them. But they're going to, you're going to promote them next rank up. They're going to have to go to another submarine and they've never commanded anyone. And suddenly, yeah, they're on an alpha class and they are the equivalent of a lieutenant. They're not on an alpha class. They're equivalent of a lieutenant commander. And they have no experience actually being in charge. Because they've never been in charge. That is the problem you have in the Soviet Navy. So then that leads us to the Kiev class, which are, thank God, basically, someone turned around and said, we can build a better hangar. Because <laughs> that's what you should look at these ships as. Uh, someone has decided they can build something better than the Moscow, which probably means that whoever built the Moscow and Leningrad, Gorshkov has um, taken outside strapped in a, uh, taken outside somewhere in Siberia and rolled down a hill maybe in a barrel full of water just to see if it's frozen by the time it's reached the bottom of the hill or maybe with an angry bear inside. I have no idea what he'll done but uh, I'm the design bureau that produced the Moskvas suddenly get very much better after the Moskvas. So I'm not sure what happened, but something drastic, I think, happened and took place. Something which they really didn't enjoy, I would presume. Anyway, the Kiev class come about. Now, they're actually a fairly decent design, but they're still able to be made a joke of. Why? Because of the Yak-38. And because people desire, or tend to evaluate these ships in a third. Whichever third they want to concentrate on, they concentrate on. They will either concentrate on the front and go, look at the firepower the ship's carried. This makes it a cruiser. So they'll look at the sort of the bow forward, uh, bow sort of bit section with weapons. Or they'll look at the commander control facilities represented by the island and look at that further ship and go, it's a commander control vessel. It's for commanding task groups. And they look at the runway and they go, or they look at the runway and they go, it's an aircraft carrier. And my answer is, why can't it be all free? Okay. This is in the time period when people are honestly producing design studies of Iowa class battleships with flight decks strapped on the side for Harriers. The fact is, they don't have carriers, they don't have a proper carrier, so. What are they thinking in terms of evolution? They are getting something better than the Moskvas. But also, what are they for? Is this for war fighting? As I've said before, war fighting for the Soviet Navy... Yes, they're going to have massive, massive missile batteries. But honestly, they are probably going to get taken out. And... I think the terminology used in some of the less discrete science fiction books and military fiction books for non-stealth aircraft at fighting stealth aircraft is clubbing baby seals. Well, if you want an actual practical demonstration of that, and frankly, I don't know why anyone would want to club baby seals. It seems an absurd thing to me to do in real life. I realise there is various things which go on, but no...
if you want to sort of consider that in real life, put a squadron of Tomcats up against a squadron of Forgers. In any simulation. Watch what happens to the Forgers. They get massacred. However, what are they good for? Well, they are good for something which the Soviet Union has been having an issue with. As you notice, this ship is being overflown quite a lot. Quite a lot of the pictures we have of the ships are from planes flying over them. Now, the Soviet Union has always got a pro had a problem up to the Yak-38 Forger, in that, A, they couldn't positively identify aircraft if they were keeping Stumm, till they were within visual range of their ships. B, and positive identification is needed, because you don't want to accidentally shoot down a friend, and that's been, you don't accidentally want to shoot down anyone if you want to avoid a war. And your options, when you don't have aircraft you can send up yourself to try and deter snooping aircraft, is to go, go away or we shoot you down. And then to shoot them down. That tends to start wars. Not very practical. So the Soviet Union had noticed that the West had been able to avoid that. The West had been able to avoid it. And honestly, they're getting there earlier with the Harrier Carrier. I know, we like to talk about the Invincible class and all these sort of things. But let's be honest, the Soviet Union got there first. This is basically a Harrier Carrier. And I wish the Invincible class had had the similar level of firepower, but possibly been, had been slightly bigger with a bigger flight that can sort of ski ramp and all those things, because I would have loved an Invincible class loaded with the equivalent fire level of firepower. It would have just... It would have been pretty to have in the Falklands War. But leaving that to one side, this is what the Soviet Union have got. They have built a carrier, the main purpose of which is not war fighting, the main purpose of which is in peacetime, going up and getting rid of those annoying snoopers when you don't want them coming around exercises. Going up and flying alongside the snooping aircraft and going, hello, we are making positive signals of you, go away. And if necessary, buzzing them. All sorts of things you can make. Because if the aircraft accidentally hit each other in midair, that's an accident because they're both flying. And if you say, well, nice the way, you were the ones getting aggressively close to our air group, uh, to our carrier battle group. We were just trying to deter you. It, it becomes a muddier issue than we shot them down with a missile because they were sniffing around with us. One starts a war. The other one makes both sides look like idiots. And it makes one side look like a reckless idiot because they were going around snooping and aggressively attacking, aggressively snooping on and the other side's carrier battle group. Which it's about political fighting. It's about winning the peace. And then we have the Kirov class. Now, this causes interesting discussions because I have, and I did love, I was having a discussion with um, someone ooh, last week on Discord. I won't name names. They are far, far more invested and interested in the Soviet Union and the Soviet Navy than I am. I love it. I find it a very interesting topic to look at because it is one of those navies which is built purely, in my mind, as a political exercise. So that makes it very interesting to study because what are the choices they're making when you don't aren't making the choices from a military perspective and naval perspective makes it interesting. The Kirov class are a great example of this. They are not the high status unit. They're a capital ship. <coughs> you can tell that by their rate of the construction. They're not even really a class because by their rate of the construction because you have Kirov, 1977, launched. Frunz, four years later, 1981, launched. Kalin, 1986, five years after Frunz, Launched. Yuri Andropov, 1989, three years after Kav uh, Kalinin. Eight years after Frunz. Twelve years after Kirov, launched. They are a series of one-offs, of differentials. They're not really a class, but 
They are a class in one perspective. What they're designed to do. Now, here is where the, my friend and my mentioner comes through. They were talking to me about the various projects and going, well, you know, these two projects are both being doing and they, it comes about and it's, it's a really weird scenario these ships come about. And I go, well, that's working out as Gorshkov wanted. And he's going, well, no, Gorshkov didn't do anything. He, he, didn't, didn't, he didn't stop them. Because, you see, what happens is you have a nuclear sh sh anti-submarine warfare vessel being designed and a nuclear-powered anti-aircraft sort of vessel, orientated vessel, being designed. And slowly these programs become two sets of Christmas trees. And slowly these Christmas tree products actually merge into one vessel. And then you have the Kirov. And guess what? There is not really a sensible... For, actually, for the Soviets, operational fighting argument for building the Kirovs when you already have the Karas, when you already have all the other ships they're building, the Kievs, all those vessels, there is not a reason. You go, command ship? Well, you've got the Kievs. Basically, that's their role. Let's be honest. They're not ro their role. Their aircraft are not rolled for wartime. No one believes the Forger is an actual wartime fighting aircraft. Anyone who tells you the Forger is actually there to fight battles in wartime likes their pilots to commit suicide, because that's what they're doing to them. Okay, that's what they're doing. So what are the Kirovs? They are status units. They are there to cause an absolute nightmare. The Slava class, they're the real class of cruisers being built. These are about causing you, in the West, a nightmare. Especially the US Navy, but also all the other navies. Because this thing turns up in a port, what do I send to match it on the political stakes? What do I have that will match it? I have nothing. Nada. Zilch. Zero. Not a thing. I can send a carrier, which will overstop it. But if I'm having to send a carrier to every port that thing has visited, it looks like I am overcompensating for something and I'm scared, doesn't it? It does. Because if I send one of my destroyers along, or one of my cruisers, which the Ticos are reclassified. Remember, they're actually destroyer leaders, and not even really good versions of that. And I want those on. They look like a bit chipped off next to this thing. It's not fair. I'm left with the position of either I ignore them and pretend I don't see them going around the world. Which looks more confident, but means that I'm losing the diplomatic battle on that front. Or I have to chase it around the world with a carrier. Yeah, these are status units. They are pitched at a point where no one who isn't building to try and win the peace because they can't win the war would go for. At this time. They are armed with everything you can possibly imagine. They are basically floating hulls of missile troops. And that works for the Soviet Union. It really does. Because that's a lot of firepower, which means I can't ignore them. And here's the other problem. Whenever the Soviet Union sails around the world, especially through places like the English Channel, etc., they get, and even today, the Russian Navy, they get followed by NATO assets. Why? Well, it's not because of we're worried they're going to suddenly launch their missiles and start a war. It's because the Soviet Navy had a habit of, if they weren't being watched, of dropping things off and causing mischief. Divers might go down and do things to undersea systems. They, they make do sort of uh, in interesting liaisons at sea. Maybe drop off boats of people to go and go into countries, etc. 
there are all sorts of things a surface ship passing you can do. So you have to watch it. Right then. So technically, I could do that with an OPV and save my ships. But then I have to deal with the image in the papers. Of an OPV next to this thing. At which point, my politicians are going to be royally annoyed with me, aren't they? So I have to send something bigger. It doesn't matter what it is, I usually have to send a frigate. Even then, though, it's going to look puny in the papers. And thank you, Western Papers, because, yes, you are a free press, and that means you can print what you like to an extent, and that means you will often print uninformed stuff of... <gasps> Our Navy overshadowed by giant Soviet vessel. Which works for the Soviet Union's propaganda and trying to win the peace. Because remember, winning the peace is about three things. One, it's about securing as many allies as you can to try and grow your own economy. Two, it's about making sure as many neutrals as you can are going to be at least mixed, if not benevolent to you. And three... It's about giving the impression to your opponent's people of your military fighting prowess. Now, here is where you can see this is really quite political rather than necessary naval. If we go back to the conscript issue, there is one advantage. It tends to mean that even your land-based equipment is going to be more rugged than it might be in the West. In the West, when you have someone who's in for a few years, they will learn how to the proper procedures of how to handle gen equipment which requires to be gentle, gentle and taken care of. You have most of the air defence, patriot systems, etc., are run by warrant officers, and that's a critical, critical component in your force you don't have those things there are two things that happen one you have to have more and more junior officers doing roles which frankly normally be done by junior ncos let alone senior ncos and two you have to design your equipment for that now this does give an advantage in that theoretically your land-based equipment which is slightly more rugged can be navalized and put on your ships because if it's rugged enough to deal with that treatment it can probably deal with the treatment it's likely to get on a ship if it's been navalized. This theoretically makes things cheaper, but this also means that your equipment is necessarily going to be far more orientated around the land battle than it is around the sea battle. However, does that really matter if your ships can't do much in a wartime? Apart from potentially die gloriously. And again, think about this in terms of modern navies. There are, I use the example of the Soviet Union as a navy which is created entirely for political reasons. For political, about political necessity, about fighting the peace, about winning the peace. About fighting the war which is undeclared before the war begins, the, uh, the declared war begins. It's not the last navy which has been designed for this purpose. It wasn't even the first, arguably. There have been lots of navies which have been built around this idea. The things that often come along are some obscenely high-value units which are in class categories which no one else would build that higher-value unit in. Now consider this. The Soviet Union are building two classes of SSBN at the same time, including the largest in the world. What I mean about two classes of SSBN... They have got the Delta Fours, which actually start production start being launched after the Typhoons. The Delta Threes are in production and overlap with the Typhoons, and then the Delta Fours come out. It's it's excessive. The point is, Gorshkov, to an extent, is gambling on having the largest submarine world, on having the fastest submarine world, on having all these things to try and win the peace. Yes, militarily, 
It makes no sense. And yes, these major programs are very expensive for the Soviet Union to do. And as they have less and uh, their economy goes on and time goes on, it becomes more and more expensive as part of their economy because their con command controlled economy can't keep up with the pressures being put on it. Because, as I've said before, and mentioned in the beginning, the communism system and command control economies can be more efficient because you focus in on an idea and you put everything in on it. But you're not necessarily going to come up with the most efficient idea. That's the, 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 the problem, basically. You need the plurality of ideas, but that system doesn't produce the plurality of ideas. And plurality of ideas and development, because that's, un that's inefficient. The whole design selection of idea process is incredibly messy and inefficient, and command systems don't like it. Control systems, uh, com armor controlled, uh, controlled economies do not like that. It's a complete waste of resources. But Gorshkov still played the hand he was dealt. And he was assisted in doing all this because he had Fleet Admiral Vladimir Sharanavin, who was in 1966 the commander of the Northern Fleet and was the person who'd organized the submarine global, uh, global and circumnavigation and was playing the hand with him. He understood what the game that Gorshkov was playing. He really did. He's still alive to this day. So, they are building two classes of ballistic missile submarines, including the largest ballistic missile. in the world. Its status. There is no earthly sensible reason to produce the Typhoon class other than hubris. Not when you already have the Deltas in service. Delta 3s, Delta 4s, and you're building them. There is no reason to build the Typhoons. Other than ego. They're colossal. They are absolutely colossal, but they are entirely a pursuit of ego. And national pride, and trying to win the peace. Because here is the headline in the Western nations. Soviet Union has largest ballistic missile submarine in the world. It doesn't matter about the missiles in the thing. It doesn't matter anything. You are basically chasing headlines. Which is probably something which, you know, it's quite scary to think about. That you're building a navy based on, well, to use a modern phraseology, clickbait. But politics and diplomacy and presence are so much about image over reality. They are so often more about image than reality. As I've discussed in a previous video, when you have a ship which looks smart and newly painted and looks glistening in the sun versus something which is rusty. When you have a vessel which is at the National Parade Day and looks spectacular, as a picture of this is something which has come in from monks at sea and hard exercises. The person who doesn't know about shipping, doesn't know about the Navy, the vast majority of the population will pick the ship which looks nice and gleaming every single time as being the more powerful vessel. Okay, you can do some tricks by judging, moving the pictures and doing all that to try and push them. But if you're doing it honestly and fairly, they'll pick the one which is cleanly painted. Think about it in terms of trucks in and cars in the parking lot. 
And when you're in, in the car park in sort of, yeah, I did sort of use an American and that comes from there, but it, this comes from one of my Canadian relatives. So I'm adapting that to British as I go. Uh, you know, if you see a car or a truck or something which looks gleaming, where it's been beautifully painted, where it's got a lovely paint job, and it's sort of it's, looks really polished and clean, you're going to think, oh, good car. Good truck. When you see something which, let's be honest, my cars often look like, uh, especially before I take them in for their bi-weekly clean, every couple of weeks. Uh, they will look mucky, because I've probably done some driving off-road to take my dogs to where they need to walk. Uh, they will look slightly beaten up, because probably been areas which have got thick hedges, and driving along, the hedges come along and put dirt all up them, mud all up them. And they've had dogs running around the back of the back seat. Yes, they're seat belted in, and so they're all fine for anything. There's an accident, but they do tend to try and move around on the back seat quite a bit as well. Um, especially when you've got them out of the seat belt and you're trying to get them out of the car, then they're running. They never come. They always run towards the other door, which is the closed door. Look out that window, then come back to you. It's a case of okay, fine. And it's had all sorts of shoes and bags and put in, things put in it and taken through and people have been travelled around it. It looks mucked up. It looks well used. Which car looks better? Which car gives you the better impression of the owner? One looks like I don't care about a car. I do care about a car. I try very hard to keep it clean, but I only have so much time and I have a lot of things to do. I love my car though. The other one might be a vehicle which is only used once every couple of years by someone who basically flies around the world and only uses it when they're back in the UK. And so, of course, it looks clean because it sits in the garage under a cover. Now, in pursuit of this scenario, we then have the Kuznetsov. Now, okay. So, you had the Yak 38 Forger and... That's not really enough. And you've watched the powers of the world, around the world using their aircraft carriers to do things like our global diplomacy. And you want to build up your alliances, especially with India, especially with Africa, to try and build political inroads there. Without the cost of building bases there, because let's be honest, building bases in Cuba was what got you into trouble. And Gorshkov remembers that. This is what an aircraft carrier is about for the Soviet Union. It's not, again, about going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And please note, anyone who starts to tell me that various modern vessels, which are being built, are parts of this class, i.e. the Shadong, Are wrong. Okay? I realize that the Liang is ex Riga Varag, which was of the same class as the Kuznetsov, which was also at one point supposed to be called Riga, then Leon, Brezhnev, then Tbilisi, and or perhaps that's in reverse. Many, many names, but eventually came Kuznetsov. But the Shanong is not. The Shadow uh, the Lianlang is completely different from what uh, because there's the hull that was built, but then there's all the stuff the Chinese added in and built up. The Shanong they built from scratch. Yes, they've used ideas. Yes, it has a similar form, but no, it should not be included in the class. It should not be included in the class by any stretch of the imagination. Now Kuznetsov is built to give the Soviet Union presence. But it's also to an extent the straw that breaks the camel's back. Because the Kuznetsov is what to an extent leads to the fall of Gorshkov. 
And this is where things get particularly interesting, because there are many people who turn around and go, well, this is the point at which the Soviet Navy ends. The Soviet Navy stops building massive projects. Really? He falls in December 1985. That's launched in 1985. Um, those are still in construction. Those are still in construction. Those are still under construction. In fact, let's be honest, Kalinin is launched in 1986, the year after Gorshkov has gone, and Andropov, 1989. If anything, they've actually increased the pace of production. Alpha class no longer, but Akuras are in production, and we're going to talk about those in a bit. If we go to the SSPNs, Delta Fours are still in production. And Typhoons are still in production. Yeah. It's because of the person who replaces him. But Gorshkov does fall because A, he's reached the point at which he has reached the extent of his power. And he has controlled the Soviet Navy now for so long. For so long. CNC 1956 to 1985. December 1985. Very close to 30 years. There is no Western Navy which has had a such consistent leadership for so long in this comparative period. Yes, he gets things wrong. Yes, he's not 100% by any stretch of the imagination. Yes, he is so, so good at doing the whole manipulation of the people around him thing. I'm, this is what I read it as whenever I look through it. and I read a little bit of Russian. I'm not really the best, but I read a little bit. And I, I read a lot of translation of Russian sources, which have been translated by, by Russians into English, which means they don't often get the English right, but they're getting the Russian right. Sometimes get the English wrong. Uh, basically, they don't always get the English right. And when I go through it, I get the strong impression this is a man who understood the power on the imagery of his navy. And he knew what he was building. But he's also smart enough to make sure that all the likely successors to him, and there are likely to be successors, and he, remember, he's in power for 30 years. There is not a single successor who he has not picked out. Every single one of those admirals that are in senior posts are in those posts because he's had them there. If they were at any point going to be less than good at carrying on his job in the way he wants to carry it carried on, they wouldn't be in those posts. You'd have to search very far through the Navy to find someone. Because he's been in post for nearly 30 years. There are entire naval careers which take place in the time he's in charge. Joining Navy, serving 25 plus years in Navy and retiring all the time he's still in charge. The discussion I had was whether he was the Soviet Union's Rick Rover. He is, but he's from a different perspective. Rick Rover is obsessed with them providing the fighting capability of a nuclear navy. And proving the fighting capability of a nuclear navy. It's all about the fighting capability for Rick Rover. And you can understand that because that's Rick Rover's entire motif is around the fighting power of the Navy he's building. Gorshkov is smart enough and realized enough to know that fighting power isn't enough for his Navy. They have to have image. They have to have the projection. The trouble is, he keeps going after new project, after new project, after new project. And that's what's expensive. That's what they can't afford. And that's what ultimately leads to his downfall. So, the new commander-in-chief, Vladimir Chernavin. He keeps the Akula class going because, frankly, 
They are, and I would argue this strongly, after the Alpha class, they are probably the next best submarine the Soviet Union is building. And they are some of the most capable vessels. Interesting enough, if we consider the crew for the Acula 1s and the Acula 2s and 3s, um, they're 73 or 60, 62. And for the Acula 2s uh, and 3s, they're 62 and 31 of them are officers. Again, sounds very like an Alpha going on here, but just different enough that they actually have sailors aboard and they can afford to have sailors aboard and it it starts to make things slightly more um better fit with the wider Soviet Navy. Aculas are powerful vessels. They're military capability. But honestly, he doesn't stop any projects. He stops new projects. He doesn't stop any existing projects. He keeps them going. He fights hard to keep them going. And as I said, at the time of recording this video, as far as I know, he's still alive. Um, I could be wrong, but I've done a few searches and I haven't found anything in the English language world at the moment which tells me he's died. He is the last Commander-in-Chief of the Soviet Navy. I think he's the only Commander-in-Chief of the Commonwealth of Indo Independent States Navy, which is 91 to 92, um, because by that point the Soviet Union has fallen. And he does his best. But he also knows... Uh, he, he tries to go for, I would say, a more military capability, more actual warfighting capability built into the force. Whereas Gorshkov had kind of gone, there is no point in me doing this. There is no chance of me doing this because of the situation I'm faced with. So I have to concentrate on winning the peace. And the ultimate example of trying to win the peace, frankly, is this, but also these. Because what do you do? Well, if you're the USA, you reactivate the Iowas. Because that's your only frigging option. <laughs> you're going, oh, you absolute total cruisers. You absolute total cru uh, cruisers. You conundrum cruisers. We're going to have to frigating reactivate a battleship just so we have a ship which we can put in a harbour a few weeks later which looks of similar status. Because let's be honest, that's an Iowa class with 16 inch guns. And yeah, the same people who get obsessed with size and only all they see is the size of the ship will see the size of those guns and think power. They won't... Yes, you've got missiles, but they will be more... Uh, that are probably more powerful, more capable than those guns. But they won't care about that because they have peon brains when it comes to naval matters. We have to reactivate the Iowas. It's all about the politics. It's a political navy. But one of the other things he does bring in, and this is something which Shanavin really should be looked at for, is he brings in Nushmani class of frigates, which are, I would argue, the first time the Soviet Union gets the medium power to an extent, a medium vessel to an extent, right. I, it is high enough status, uh, capable enough that it's the high status asset in low secure, uh, low threat scenarios. And it's capable enough it can be the low state of, uh, the low asset in high threat scenarios. And I would say this has become the model of Russian this frigate construction ever since. They're very capable. They're one of the classes which are least talked about from the Soviet Union because of when they come in. They come in in 1988, so they don't make the impact because the Soviet Union falls three years later. And so they get put to one side. But really, after years and years of building and building ships, they finally get the medium asset right. They really do with this class. They're 
just on all the capability lines. So, summary. Ah, oh, the Soviet Navy. Every other time I've done this summary, I've got Norman Palmer out and I've gone, yes. It's useful. I had to try and provide something across the entire period that could be a touchstone for the entirety of the period. That was difficult, to say the least. Why was it so difficult? Because most of the books focus on specific periods. There are some very good books on World War II and the Soviet Navy. There are really, really good books on warships of the Soviet fleets, 39 to 1945. I've got one volume here already. I've got the other volume on the way. I've got major and minor surface and minor combatants. And I'm hoping to get, I think volume three is going to be submarines, and I'm hoping to get that. They are absolutely wonderful books, judging by those I've already read. But the trouble is, they focus on World War II. And then there are books which focus on the Soviet Union of the uh, Soviet Union navies of the Cold War. And mostly, they look at it from the 1960s onwards. So they miss out the period of 1945, uh, 1945 to 1960. And don't get me started on the interwar period. There is literally one decent book. The rest are... They're either written by people who view navies as pointless for land power, which, if, again, militarily, I can't make a case against, but if you're going to then write a book about the Soviet Navy, why write it if you think it's pointless? You're not going to write a good book. Or by people who think er look at everything through the war fighting capability of a navy and spend their whole time going, this was terrible, this couldn't do this, this couldn't do that, couldn't do this, couldn't do that, couldn't do everything, couldn't do this, couldn't do that, couldn't do this, couldn't do... And you sit there and go, again, what are you looking at this ship for? You've got it compared to some kind of perfect warship in your mind. A... Look around the fleets of the period. You will find not find that perfect warship. That perfect warship does not exist. No one was building a perfect warship. And you have to understand, where are the compromises coming from? Why are the compromises in existence? What are the compromises for between your ship and a perfect ship? The only purpose to have a perfect ship in your mind as archetypal light cruiser, heavy cruiser, battle, a capital sh battleship, and all these things. Only purpose for it to have is to have a consistent benchmark to look at and look at ships and go, why are you differing from that point? Why are you differing from this? But the trouble is, the perfect cruiser for the US Navy won't be the same as the perfect cruiser for the Royal Navy, won't be the same as the perfect cruiser for the French Navy or the Italian Navy, because each nation has different geostrategic needs. So therefore, you can't use a mythical, perfect cruiser that you would design in the treaty you would design as a cost point for analyzing, analyzing and comparing with everyone else's cruisers. And you definitely can't use it for the Soviet Union, which A, wasn't a signatory of the treaty system, but B, had a very different geostrategic scenario than everyone else. The Soviet Navy is... A navy which has had to fight hard. It had to fight hard from its conception. It has never had the infrastructure. It has never had the support. It has never had the bases it needs to be the force that people think it should be. Because people always treat it as if the, Ameri the Soviet Union was building a force to fight the Americans. To match the Americans. They're not. They're building a force which is going to do three roles. One, delay the Americans as much, getting Americans and the West and NATO forces from getting to their coast 
for as long as possible. Two, to provide, especially once ballistic missile submarines uh, come in, a part of their strategic deterrent, which whilst they don't really need it considering the size and the scope of the Soviet Union, the fact is, you could, uh, whilst theoretically you can find everything on land, especially once you have satellites, actually finding it, targeting it, and taking it out is quite a big, or quite a big task, especially before they launch, especially if you think it's going to be an all nuclear war. But yes, you add into the whole point of being part of a nuclear triad to your force structure. Okay. But the biggest reason and the biggest key thing the Soviet Navy can give the Soviet Union is nothing to do with war fighting, it's nothing to do with strategic deterrent, it's winning the peace. It's making the Soviet Union look powerful around the world. It's making the Soviet Union capable around the world. It's making the Soviet Union an ally you want around the world. It's making the Soviet Union strong enough around the world that NATO, that the West cannot take the rest of the world for granted. And that's the other problem with the surface raiders from a Western perspective. Because if you don't go and deal the surface raiders, then those nations might say, well, actually, what if you're not going to come help us out? Why should we be involved in? Why should we have our ships put at risk by you? Let's flag them differently and let's send them elsewhere. And then there are a lot of supply chains which are very important, which flow around the world. And if you have your merchant ships being reflagged, well, when you lose a merchant ship, that's a ship you've lost for the convoys. Doesn't matter to the Soviet Union whether it's taught sunk or it's reflagged and someone else is operating it on a different route. It doesn't matter to them how you lose that ship. What matters to them is you lose that ship. Because it's going to make a difference in the long war. This is the reality of the Soviet Navy. It's about winning the peace, not war fighting. And that is a fairly contentious position when I make that case. There are not many colleagues who would agree with me, so I am not expecting to have a sea of agreement beneath this video. But it makes sense. It has a logic. I don't claim to be the only one who thinks this way. I don't claim to be the originator of this idea. There will be others who have said it along this way and I'm there. But it does bring us back to the old conundrum. Naval strategy is procurement strategy, because you don't have capabilities unless you procure it. And that's the thing about the Soviet Navy. They are a lot of procurement. But are they really capabilities when it comes to warfighting? If they're not, then what capabilities are they procuring? And that's how you can start to look at their strategy. And that's where you start to make sense of these things. So, question, as I always put a question at the end of these, if you were procuring, let's say you could now turn around for whichever navy you wanted in the world, which your own navy, and you could procure a class of ships, four vessels, purely for status. You didn't really have to care about the war fighting necessity of them. that they bring in terms of status of having those vessels what vessels would you procure and what would they look like I'd love to hear what you think 
Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. Um, I hope you enjoyed the series. I hope you're going to join me for the live, which is next Friday. Uh, this is what we have going on at the moment. Ooh, yeah, this swapped places with Patron 69's Long Patrol because, well, as I said, I think this video has been cursed. It's so many different versions. So many different versions. And now I'm off out to family lunch for, uh, for a Christmas lunch, and then I'm coming back and hopefully recording HMS Warrior. <laughs> well, the bits inside the uh, inside my office. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and um, take care. Toodles.